Book of Heaven, Volume 18, Part 1 J. M. J. August 9, 1925 How requiting God in love for all created things enters the first duty of the creature. The divine will was given as primary life of the creature. My Jesus, give me strength. You who see the great repugnances I feel in writing, such that if it wasn't for blessed obedience and for fear of displeasing you, I would not have written a single word any more. Your long privations daze me and render me incapable of anything. Therefore, I need greater help in order to put on paper what your holy will whispers to me. Therefore, give me your hand and be always with me. Now, while I was fusing myself in the holy divine volition, in order to requite God in love for everything he had done in creation, for love of creatures. A thought was telling me that it was not necessary to do that, that this way of praying was not pleasing to my Jesus, and that these are inventions of my mind. And my always lovable Jesus, moving in my interior, told me, My daughter, you must know that this way of praying and that is, to requite God in love for all the things created by him, is a divine right, and it enters the first duty of the creature. The creation was made for love of man. Even more, our love was so great, that had it been necessary, we would have created as many heavens, as many suns, stars, seas, earths, plants, and all the rest, for as many creatures as were to come to the light of this world, so that each one of them might have a creation for herself, a universe of her own. And in fact, when everything was created, Adam was the only spectator of all creation. He could enjoy all the good he wanted. And if we did not do so, it was because man could enjoy everything anyway, as if it were his own, even if others also might enjoy it. In fact, who cannot say, the sun is mine, and enjoy the light of the sun as much as he wants, or the water is mine, and quench his thirst and make use of it there where he needs it, or the sea, the earth, the fire, the air are my things. And so with many other things created by me. And if it seems that man lacks something, that life suffers hardships, it is because of sin that barring the way of my benefits prevents the things created by me from being abundant for the ungrateful creature. So, given all this, that in all created things, God bound his love toward each creature, hers was the duty to requite God with her little love, with her gratitude, with her thank you, to he who had done so much for her. Not requiting God in love for everything he has done for man and creation, is the first fraud that the creature makes against God. It is to usurp his gifts without even recognizing where they come from and he who has loved her so much. Therefore, this is the first duty of the creature. And this duty is so indispensable and important that she who took to heart all our glory our defense, our interest, did nothing but make her round through all the spheres, from the smallest to the greatest thing created by God, in order to impress her requital of love, 
of glory, of thanksgiving, for all, and in the name of all human generations. Ah, yes, it was precisely my celestial mamma who filled heaven and earth with the requital for everything that God had done in creation. After her came my humanity, that fulfilled this duty so sacrosanct, in which the creature had so very much failed, and rendered my celestial father benevolent toward guilty man. So these were my prayers and those of my inseparable mamma. Don't you want, then, to repeat my very prayers? Even more, this is why I have called you into my will, that you may associate yourself with us and follow and repeat our acts. So I tried as much as I could to make my round through all created things, to give to my God the requital of love, of glory, of gratitude for everything he had done in creation. I seem to see in all created things the requital of love of my Empress Mama and of my beloved Jesus. This requital formed the most beautiful harmony between heaven and earth and bound the Creator to the creature. Each requital of love was a key, a little sonata of enrapturing celestial music. And my sweet Jesus added, My daughter, all created things were nothing other than an act of our will that issued them, nor can they move or change the effects, the position, or the office that each of them received by its creator. They are nothing other than mirrors in which man was to admire the reflections of the qualities of his creator. In some, the power. In some, the beauty. In other created things, the goodness, the immensity, the light, and so forth. In sum, each created thing preaches to man the qualities of its creator, and with mute voices they tell him how much I love him. On the other hand, in creating man, it was not just our will, but an emanation that came out of our womb, a part of ourselves that we infused in him. And this is why we created him with a free will, that he might grow always in beauty, in wisdom, in virtue. In our likeness, he could multiply his goods, his graces. Oh, if a son had a free will and could make two sons from one, four sons from two, what glory! What honor would it not give to its creator, and how much glory also to itself? Yet what the created things cannot do, because they are without a free will, and because they were created to serve man, man can do, because he was to serve God. So all our love was centralized in man, and this is why we placed all creation at his disposal, all ordered around him, that man might make use of our works, like as many stairs and ways, in order to come to us, to know us, and to love us. But what is our sorrow in seeing man below our created things? Even more, his beautiful soul, given by us, transformed into ugliness by sin, and not only ungrown in good, but horrid to the sight. Yet, as if everything that was created for him were not enough to our love, in order to preserve this free will, 
we gave him the greatest gift that surpassed all other gifts. We gave him our will as preserver, as antidote, as prevenience and help for his free will. So our will placed itself at his disposal to give him all those aids that man might need. Our will was given to him as primary life and as the first act of all his works. Having to grow in grace and in beauty, he needed a supreme will that would not only keep company with his human will, but would substitute for the operating of the creature. But this great gift also he despised and did not want to know. See then how our will enters the primary life of the creature, and as long as it maintains its first act, its life, the creature grows always in grace, in light, in beauty. She preserves the bond of the first act of her creation, and we receive the glory of all created things because they serve our will operating in the creature, the only purpose of all creation. Therefore I recommend to you, let our will be more than life for you, and the first act of all your actions. August 15th, 1925 All created things run toward man, the Feast of the Assumption should be called Feast of the Divine Will. I continued to fuse myself in the Holy Divine Volition to requite my Jesus with my little love for everything he has done for mankind in creation. And my beloved Jesus, moving in my interior in order to give more value to my little love, did what I was doing to gather with me. Meanwhile, he told me, My daughter, all created things were made for man, and all of them run toward man. They have no feet, but they all walk. They all have motion, either to find him or to be found. The light of the sun departs from the height of the heavens in order to find the creature, illuminate him, and warm him. The water walks in order to reach even into the human bowels, to quench his thirst and to refresh him. The plant, the seed, walks, rips the earth and forms its fruit to give itself to man. There is not one created thing that does not have a step a motion toward the one to whom the eternal maker had directed it in its creation. My will maintains the order, the harmony, and keeps them all on their way toward the creatures. So it is my will that walks constantly toward the creature within created things. It never stops. It is all motion toward the one whom it loves so much. Yet who says a thank you to my will that brings him the light of the sun, the water for drinking in order to quench his thirst, the bread to satisfy his hunger, the fruit, the flower to cheer him, and many other things that it brings to him to make him happy? Is it not right that since my will does everything for man, man should do everything to fulfill my will? Oh, if you knew the feast that my will makes in created things, when it walks to and serves the one who fulfills my will, my will operating and fulfilled in the creature, and my will operating in created things, kiss each other as they meet, they harmonize, they love each other, 
and formed the hymn of adoration for their creator and the greatest portent of all creation. Created things feel honored when they serve a creature who is animated by that same will that forms their very life. On the other hand, my will takes the attitude of sorrow in those same created things when it has to serve one who does not fulfill my will. This is why it happens that many times created things place themselves against man. They strike him. They chastise him. Because they become superior to man as they keep intact within themselves that divine will by which they were animated from the very beginning of their creation, while man has descended down below. For he does not keep the will of his creator within himself. After this, I began to think about the feast of my celestial mamma assumed into heaven. And my sweet Jesus, with a tender and moving tone, added, My daughter, the true name of this feast should be feast of the divine will. It was the human will that closed heaven, broke the bonds with its creator, made miseries and sorrow enter the field, and put an end to the feast that the creature was to enjoy in heaven. Now, this creature, queen of all, by doing the will of the eternal one always and in everything, even more, it can be said that her life was divine will alone, opened the heavens, bound herself to the Eternal One, and restored in heaven the feasts with the creature. Every act she did in the supreme will was a feast that she started in heaven. It was sons that she formed to adorn this feast. It was melodies that she sent to delight the celestial Jerusalem. So the true cause of this feast is the eternal will operating and fulfilled in my celestial mamma. It operated such prodigies in her as to astonish heaven and earth, chain the eternal one with indissoluble bonds of love, and capture the word even into her womb. The very angels, enraptured, repeated among themselves, From where comes so much glory, so much honor, such greatness and prodigies never before seen in this excelling creature? Yet it is from the exile that she is coming. Astonished, they recognized the will of their creator as a life operating in her, and trembling, they said, Holy, 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 honor and glory to the will of our sovereign Lord, and glory, and thrice holy, she who let this supreme will operate. So it is my will that more than anything was and is celebrated on the day of the assumption into heaven of my most holy mother, it was my will alone that made her ascend so high as to distinguish her among all. Everything else would have been as nothing had she not possessed the prodigy of my will. It was my will that gave her divine fecundity and made her the mother of the word. It was my will that made her see and embrace all creatures together becoming the mother of all and loving all with a love of divine maternity and making her the queen of all it made her rule and dominate on that day my will received the first honors the glory and the abundant fruit of its work in creation and it began its feast which it never interrupts for the glorification of its operating in my beloved mother. And even though heaven was opened by me and many saints were already in possession of the celestial fatherland 
when this celestial queen was assumed into heaven. However, she herself was the primary cause, having fulfilled the supreme will in everything. And therefore, we waited for she who had honored it so much and contained the true prodigy of the most holy will to make the first feast for the supreme volition. Oh, how the whole of heaven magnified, blessed, and praised the eternal will upon seeing this sublime queen enter the empyrium in the midst of the celestial court, all circumfused by the eternal son of the supreme volition. They saw her all studded with the power of the supreme fiat. There had been not even a heartbeat in her that did not have this fiat impressed on it. And astonished, they looked at her and said to her, Ascend, ascend higher. It is right that she who so much honored the supreme fiat and through whom we find ourselves in the celestial fatherland have the highest throne and be our queen. And the greatest honor that my mamma received was to see the divine will glorified. September 16th, 1925. Jesus was always the same in his pains. To be always the same is a divine virtue. The Silence of Jesus. My days are ever more bitter because of the long privations of my sweet Jesus. His will alone is left to me as precious inheritance of the so many visits he made to my poor soul. And now I have been left alone, forgotten by he who formed my life. So much so that it seemed to me that we were fused together and that neither could he be without me, nor I without him. And while I think, where, where did he go who loved me so much? What have I done that he has left me? Ah, Jesus, come back. Come back, for I can take no more. And while I would like to abandon myself to sorrow, and think of my great misfortune of having lost him, in whom I had enclosed all my hopes and my happiness. The holy divine volition imposes itself on me, making me follow the course of my acts in his adorable will. And it almost prevents me from grieving more for being without my only good. So I remain as though petrified, intrepid, all alone, without the slightest comfort, either from heaven or from the earth. Now, while I was in this state, I was thinking about various pains of the passion of Jesus, who, making himself seen for a little while, told me, My daughter, in all my pains, I was always the same. I never changed. My gaze was always sweet. My face always serene. My words always calm and dignified. In my whole person, I had such equality of manners that if they had wanted to recognize me as their redeemer, merely by my way, always the same in everything and for everything, they would have recognized me. It is true that my pains were so many as to eclipse me and surround me like many clouds, but this says nothing. After the heat of the pains, I would reappear in the midst of my enemies like majestic sun with my usual serenity, 
and with my same manners, always equal and peaceful. To be always the same is only of God and of the true children of God. The way that is always equal to itself impresses the divine character in the soul and reveals the operating of creatures as pure and holy. On the other hand, a changing character is of creatures and it is a sign of passions that roar within the human heart, that tyrannize it in such a way as to show an unpleasant character also on the outside, that displeases everyone. Therefore, I recommend to you that you be always the same, with me, with yourself, and with others. The same in the pains, and even my very privation. The unchanging character must be indelible in you. And even though the pains of my privation knock you down and form the clouds of sorrow inside and outside of you, your unchanging manners shall be light that shall dispel these clouds and shall reveal how, though hidden, I dwell within you. After this, I continued to think about the pains of the passion of my adorable Jesus, with the nail of his privation in my heart. And my lovable Jesus made himself seen in my interior, all taciturn and so afflicted as to arouse pity. And I said to him, My love, why are you silent? It seems to me that you don't want to tell me anything any more nor confide to me your secrets and your pains any longer. And Jesus, all goodness but afflicted, told me, My daughter, being silent, says something greater than what speaking says. To be silent is the decision of the one who, not wanting to be dissuaded, keeps silent. The silence of a father with a beloved son of his, while in the midst of other unruly sons, is a sign that he wants to strike the perverted sons. Do you think it is nothing that I do not come to you, and that I am sparing in the sharing of my pains with you? Ah, oh, my daughter, it isn't nothing. On the contrary, it is something great. As I do not come to you, my justice becomes filled with scourges in order to strike man, so much so that all the past evils, the earthquakes, the wars, shall be as nothing compared to the evils that shall come, and to the great war and revolution that they are preparing. Sins are so many that men do not deserve that I share my pains with you in order to free them from the scourges deserved. Therefore have patience. My will shall make up for my visible presence, though I remain hidden in you. And if it were not so, you could not have kept the pace in making your usual rounds in my will. It is I who, though hidden, do them within you, and you follow him whom you do not see. However, once my justice has completed the filling of scourges, I shall be with you like before. Therefore, courage, wait for me and do not fear. Now, while he was saying this, I found myself outside of myself, in the midst of the world. In almost all nations, one could see preparations for war, new, more tragic ways of fighting, that struck fright at the mere sight. And then the great human blindness that, becoming yet more blind, acted like a beast, not like a man. 
and because it was blind, it could not see that, while wounding others, it wounded itself. And then all frightened, I found myself back inside myself, all alone, without my Jesus, and with the nail in my heart, that he whom I love had departed from me, leaving me alone and abandoned. And while I, raving and agonizing because of the pain, my sweet Jesus, moving in my interior and sighing because of my heart state, told me, My daughter, calm yourself. Calm yourself. I am within you. I do not leave you. And besides, how can I leave you? Look, my will is everywhere. If you are in my will, I do not know where to go, nor do I find a place in order to move away from you. I would have to render my will limited and gather it in one point in order to leave you. But I cannot do this either. My immensity extends everywhere, and my nature renders all that belongs to me immense. Therefore, immense is my will, my power, my love, my wisdom, and so forth. So how can I leave you if I find you everywhere in my will? Therefore, be sure that I do not leave you, and plunge yourself ever more deeply into the immensity of the abyss of my will. You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 18, Part 1. Fiat.